Hello everyone and welcome to our fourth session today on citizen science and today we have uh, our guest today is Sona Shahani and Sona is going to talk to us about the amazing pictures she has taken from literally from her balcony on uh, the astronomy pictures and uh, we welcome her today to our special session on discussing how to do astrophotography. So welcome Sona. And uh, thank you so much. So Sona Shahani Shukla is actually an entrepreneur by, prefer, by profession, managing her firm servicing more than 550 people. She has corporate clients across India and abroad. She's passionate about astronomy and Peru's that as a hobby actively since 2018. Sona is a mother of two teenage kids living in Delhi and uh, which Delhi we all know have very bad skies, but the imaging she's gonna show us are, are done from her small balcony facing the Southeast where she has used, uh, she's going to talk about astrophotography, specifically more with the telescope, but she's also done it with smartphones. And uh, we are looking forward to hearing from Sona as to how on her journey with astrophotography. So welcome Sona and over on to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Priya Hassan for welcoming me. Thank you so much, uh, Shrishti Astronomy and Mr. Sovan Acharya for giving me this opportunity. I'm very excited, you know, anything to talk about astronomy, I get very, very super excited. So I'm very excited. I'm going to start sharing my screen and uh, show you what I have learned so far. Can I start, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, please do, please do. Is my screen visible to everyone? Yeah, perfect. All good. So uh, this is my pseudo name. Astro by Sona. That's how I'm known on various uh, social media platforms, uh, YouTube or Instagram. So I'm going to talk about astrophotography specifically with a telescope. Um, I've been practicing it for uh, not more than two years now. And I'm going to give you an insight, a pictorial insight into my journey so far. So what are we going to cover in today's session? Uh, I'm going to tell you how it all began for me and uh, hope that you all can relate how it begins for you know people. What does it entail to become an astrophotographer? I'm going to share some techniques and processes that I've learned uh, over the years practicing. This is all self-taught. A lot of resources are available these days. Then I'm going to share the best practices of planetary imaging. Uh, this is something which is, you know, this is practice. This is not theoretical uh, gyan that I'm going to share with you all. And I'm also going to give you a glimpse on uh, what are the rare events that I've been capturing as, as Priya Ma'am said from Delhi, bottle nine skies <laughs> from my Southeast balcony. So here we go, how it all began for me. So this is not something, uh, you know, a textbook thing that I was a science student, I was into astronomy, I was into physics, no, nothing like that. I have, as Priya Ma'am said, I'm an entrepreneur. I run my own uh, marketing firm. And one of my business coaches was asking me that, what are you doing for yourself? What is your soul happy with? And this was 2018. I was going through my business coaching sessions and I realized that I wasn't doing much. You know, as a lady, if there are ladies in the, as participants, you would realize that there's so much that you give and there's hardly any time for your own self. So that question stuck with me. And I said, what can I do for myself? What makes me happy? And uh, Naturally, astronomy was something that I was very tuned into. I was uh, raised in Delhi. And trust me, Delhi skies were not bad. It was not bottle eight always. In 1984, when Asian Games happened in Delhi, that is when actually the sky started becoming bad because the development was rampant. Before that, I remember sleeping on the rooftops in Delhi because that was the trend. We were not confined to our air-conditioned bedrooms. We used to sleep uh, on the rooftops, watching the beautiful skies. You know, I remember watching minor Ursa from Delhi. If I tell this thing to somebody today, they will certainly, you know, 
be very dis they will disbelieve and they will not agree with me that I can see minor ursa from Delhi in today's skies. But way back when I was a little kid, yes, I could see minor ursa very clearly. I remember that. So astronomy has, you know, the skies have always fascinated me. So to answer my business coach, I said, okay, fair enough. I would take up astronomy. And guess what? A beginner's mistake. I would say that every beginner makes certain mistakes because we do not take time into researching. As I wanted something, I, you know, dwelled into it and I gifted myself uh, an Astromaster 130EQ. This is a Celestron model. This is hugely sellable. It's available on Amazon all the time. And I thought this was a very good telescope and I should buy it. And that is going to, you know, give me the beautiful glimpse of the night skies. A couple of factors I was missing. Uh, one has to get acquainted with the equatorial mount, whether it's a manual mount or a go-to mount, doesn't matter. Equatorial mount has certain principles. You have to learn those. I didn't learn that. And uh, to get it out of the box and you know start plug and play, it wasn't that easy. I was not even getting focused to begin with. And then I reached out to Nehru Planetarium. I called them and I said, um, how can I learn using this telescope? So yeah, that's a beginner's mistake. But Nehru Planetarium was very accommodating. Um, I remember they gave me number of Mr. Ajay Talwar. I immediately contacted him and he said, why don't you join a WhatsApp group? So that was my first actual resource um, in learning astronomy. That was my first contact with real astronomers, astrophotographers, and some wonderful kind people. I joined one of the star parties in Sarathal, but taking my astromaster to that uh, star party, I did not know how to set it up also. It was badly collimated. I couldn't see anything. A couple of people helped me there, put it together, and I was able to see moon. That was all I see uh, from Astromaster. That is all I could do. So as I said, that was a beginner's mistake. And uh, carrying it was another task. Putting it together was another task. So the moral of the story is that you know once you're starting, once you've decided that you want to get into astronomy, now, when I look back in hindsight, I really urge all the beginners to first do your research, get acquainted, because if you're not going to pick it up, it's not plug and play, if it is not convenient for you, you will not be inclined towards using that telescope. So that was something which is a big learning for me. Then I switched on to 8-inch Skywatcher Flex Tube Dobsonian. This was in September 2019 that I bought my second telescope. I had to give away 2018 Astromaster. I had to sell it. Um, setting up a Dobsonian, so I'm going to show you a picture of what my Astromaster looked like. It was a beautiful. Now I can, you know, start using it. I can certainly use it. But way, way back when I started, it was an equipment that I was not happy with. This is the current equipment that I still own. I still work with this. This is a flex tube Skywatcher Dobsonian. And uh, setting up a Dobsonian, if you look at this, this just takes two minutes. Once you have um, you know, done the Dobsonian mount, the lower part is known as the Dobsonian mount. And the upper part is essentially a reflector telescope. It has two mirrors, a secondary and a primary. This is under two minutes, you know, in some seconds you're able to set it up. So setting up a Dobsonian was fairly easy. I was able to use it off the box right away. And the other thing that I opted was that storing uh, Dobsonian was also easy because it's a collapsible feature. Um, it can fairly and easily fit into my boot space in my car so I could take it, I could travel with it. So essentially, when I started with astronomy, the whole purpose, the whole goal was to look at the gems of the night sky. So it was completely purely visual astronomy. And as you, as some of you, if you are acquainted with telescopes, people will tell you that Dobsonians are not meant for astrophotography, which is partially true, but yeah, you can do stuff. I'm going to show you that what you can do with a Dobsonian. So as I said, you know, I was into visual astronomy and I wanted to see the night sky as I was uh, remembering what I used to see from Delhi skies when I was a little kid, but 2018 onwards, the skies are just not good. You just can't see anything. And one day, incidentally, my 
younger child, my teenage daughter, she said, you know, mom, what are you looking at? I said, I'm looking at the moon. She said, why don't you put your phone on the eyepiece and see what moon looks like? And she did that for me. I was so shocked and amazed looking at moon. I was like, oh my God, this is beautiful. This is way better than what my eyes can, you know, see. So this is a little incident turned into my journey or my leap into astrophotography. So I started with a smartphone. On the right, you can see the image where my phone is uh, snugly uh, attached to the eyepiece through an adapter on my eight inch Skywatcher Dobsonian. This is what uh, I bought. Um, fortunately, this is available on Amazon. A uh, lot of people these days that are here are buying adapters, which are like 4,000 rupees. Uh, the retailers or the dealers are selling it. But trust me, this very normal piece of equipment uh, has done wonders. It can do wonders. You don't have to invest heavily in a smartphone uh, adapter. So these are the first images that I captured of Moon, but Opus, and these are all single shots. I didn't start with learning how to stack the images. I had you know, no idea. I didn't know how to stack images. So these two images that you see on your screen are completely, these are the single shots. It actually felt very unreal. Now what you see on your screen is Jupiter with a beautiful four moons, teeny tiny. This is what you can see through uh, your phone screen. This is the actual real image of Jupiter, which I was able to see and capture using my smartphone. It looks uh, very small uh, and it gives you details, but uh, everything, I think, uh, when I started ast uh, astrophotography, everything has been a challenge for me, but there are solutions and there are ways how you can overcome your challenges. <clears throat> this is what Saturn looks like through an iPhone camera placed on a Skywatcher Dobsonian. You see, there is a lot of tremble because it's a manual Dobsonian and it goes out of the screen because of Earth's rotation. <clears throat> this is the first time I saw Mars. I remember this is 28th June 2021 that I saw Mars for the first, 2020, sorry. This is 2020, 5.21 a.m. in the morning. This is the first glimpse of Mars. I had never seen Mars before in my life. I've never seen Mars image also before in my life. So this was, you know, one of those aha moment that, oh my God, I'm able to see Mars from my eight inch Dobsonian. Now, why I showed you these three videos, my intention was not to show you what planets look like through an eight inch Dobsonian or an iPhone camera. The whole purpose of showing you these videos was to introduce to you a technique called lucky imaging. Because as previously I showed you the moon images that I'd taken initially, those were just single shots. But for planetary, lucky imaging is used. In layman's term, you need to take videos of planets. The simple reason, planets, moon, sun, is too bright. If you start taking frames, if you even take an exposure, um, one hundredth of a second, you either won't get much detail or you'll just get very bright blob. So you require short exposures, but you requi require lots and lots of frames. So the easiest way to capture or image a planet is using lucky imaging. There are a lot more articles written in magazines like Sky and Telescope, BBC Sky at Night, so if anybody wants to do more research on lucky imaging, please do look up and read out some wonderfully written articles on lucky imaging. The other benefit of lucky imaging is that you are imaging planets and they are within our solar system. So you are facing a lot of atmospheric turbulence when you're trying to image them. So it's better to take as many frames as possible and probably, you know, for a, for, a, for a fraction of a second, the atmosphere will be so stable that you will get that lucky image, hence the name lucky imaging. There are many software, there are softwares which are absolutely free of cost where you can process these uh, videos that you have taken. 
So no need to spend more money. You just need to do take videos. And when I was using my iPhone for photography, astrophotography, it gives me a 4K video and it has about 30 FPS rate, which was a good frame rate to start with and start doing lucky imaging. So the whole moral of the story is that if you want to do planetary, please start using lucky imaging, which is simply to put, start using your video mode of the phone. And uh, this is the stacked image. You saw the video, the Mars video that I shared with you. This is what the stacked image looked like. I learned stacking. So eventually, once you get into astrophotography, there are certain things that is a natural progression. You have to understand you won't get the depth or the features of planet if you don't do stacking. And this is what, uh, this is all smartphone, by the way, smartphone photography. This is Saturn, this is Jupiter. These are all my initial works. Uh, this is somewhere in 2019, end of 2019 that I was doing smartphone astrophotography. And all that, there are certain uh, softwares that I can introduce to you. You can always watch this tutorial on my YouTube channel by the name Astro by Sona. I would love to, you know, share it right now, but it's going to, it's a whole session in itself. So we would skip that part and uh, we would start to complete my journey. So this is the second step in my astrophotography journey. And then I start an imaging with a DSLR because that's natural progression. You need sensor size, you need resolution to get good images. And I had a DSLR uh, at home. I had never used it, to be honest. And uh, I just used it once for Star Trails workshop that I'd gone uh, for. And um, I was not acquainted with my DSLR as well. So I learned using my DSLR. This is a T ring that you see on the bottom of the image. This helps you attach your DSLR because you have to remove the lens from your DSLR. The lens, your telescope becomes the lens for the DSLR. And this is a small demonstration of how I would attach my DSLR to my uh, flex tube Dobsonian. Uh, you would see that it's uh, in the focuser. Uh, there is the one and a quarter inch adapter. And I'm assuming that people are acquainted with telescope and the components of telescope. If you're not, uh, you can look it up or I can take up the questions later on uh, when we finish this presentation. If you see the focuser, there's a one and a quarter inch focuser which comes with the Dobsonian or any telescope that you buy. I have put another adapter, GSO adapter, where I would put the eyepiece because there is a, a problem with uh, Dobsonian and DSLR photography. The DSLR's sensor, the, the flange area, the back focus is too much. So the image does not travel to the sensor. You need to, I, you know, I succeeded by using eyepiece projection technique. There is no other way that I was able to attach my DSLR and get image from my DSLR. So this is a technique that I used. If you have questions more about it, I will be happy to take it up at the end of the session. And um, after using the DSLR, um, these are the images that I get. Yeah, you can see a little bit of progress that I made from the smartphone uh, photography to the DSLR images that I captured. Uh, this is again Jupiter. I was highly successful capturing Jupiter because Jupiter was uh, Jupiter is fairly bright object in the night sky. This is Venus. Now, anybody attempting to shoot uh, capture G uh, Venus through a DSLR, you would always face this problem because you are doing video mode, and it is very very bright. Uh, you know, you don't uh, even don't know how to focus it while using a DSLR. What you can do is that you can use uh, a moon filter in case you have a moon filter with, you know, normally anybody doing even visual astronomy has a moon filter because the moon is so bright, it just hits your eyes. So I used that uh, trick to get Venus uh, imaged through DSLR. Use your moon glow filter, threaded it into the adapter, and uh, there it is. That is Venus. Moving on to my favorite subject, that is a lunar image that I took with my DSLR and my telescope. So the telescope is my lens. It is at 1200 mm focal length. And uh, you could see it. Uh, it's a very in-depth image because it's not a single image. When you take a single shot of moon, 
you do get a beautiful image as I showed you from my smartphone photography also, but the kind of depth a DSLR gives you at, that's an, at another level itself. The resolution is much, much better. This is a pretty picture of mineral moon because I, I was seeing a lot of gray moon and uh, somehow, you know, all the nebulas that we see, all the images that we see have wonderful colors. So why not moon? And these are true colors. I have not superimposed any colors. These are, you know, surface features of moon with colors. This is another image that I uh, annotated the Apollo landing sites uh, of all the, um, on the moon surface. Again, DSLR image. This is also DSLR image. Here, I must have stacked around 40 to 50 images of full moon. And then I uh, used the process, the stacking process. And then I used Lightroom uh, and Photoshop to get the mineral moon colors. And all of this is from my Southeast balcony facing Southeast and uh, it's a small balcony. Uh, it's convenient because planets uh, are always visible on that part of the sky. And this is from Delhi skies, bottle nine skies. And I have another uh, light pollution problem that across the balcony, I have two strong LED street lights. They're just in my eyes all the time, but uh, yeah, I manage. So we have challenges and we just need to overcome the challenges. This is another mineral moon. I have a full moon stacking video also in case anybody is interested to learn how do you stack the moon images, please feel free to go and access it. So finally in August 22, so I started my journey in 2018 buying my first telescope that was end of 2018 and 2019 and like September I bought my second telescope which was 8 inch Skywatcher Dobsonian and then I from visual astronomy, I moved on to um, smartphone astrophotography. Then I moved on to DSLR imaging, uh, using planet, uh, planetary imaging through DSLR. And then I took the very obvious plunge. I bought myself a planetary camera. This is an astro dedicated camera, meaning that uh, it's actually built for low light performance and high FPS. This was a giant uh, leap for me and learning curve again, because uh, I'll show you how different it is from the other two cameras that I was used to using. This is a very different ball game altogether, but uh, trust me, it is a different world altogether. And uh, this is how my setup, now I'm going to show you the small balcony that, you know, Priya ma'am was mentioning in the early, uh, my introduction. And this is what actually the balcony looks like. It's a cramped place. Uh, I have a bigger balcony, which is the north facing balcony, but uh, I can't see any planets there. So this is my small balcony that I use for astrophotography. This is how my setup looks like. And if you carefully look at, you could see a bed sheet also, because that prevents the the glaring street lights that uh, otherwise would uh, hamper my astrophotography session. The big difference that I was talking about, yes, it has uh, the sensor, which is actually built for astrophotography, but the huge differences at the back of it, there is no live view. In the smartphone, you can use your screen uh, to see you know, if the, the planet is in the view, if it is aligned, but uh, with an astro dedicated camera, you have to use a laptop. So laptop is connected with my uh, camera. Now, from uh, jumping from DSLR, DSLR also has a live screen. Your mobile phone has a live screen, but an astro dedicated camera does not have a live screen. So it was very, very challenging, very difficult for me to get, it's a manual Dobsonian. It's not that I will, you know, ask it to go and slew it to Jupiter and I would see Jupiter immediately on my uh, screen. It doesn't work like that. It's a manual Dobsonian. So if anybody is interested, um, I'm giving you tips that I've learned from my journey. So if you look uh, above, you can see a finder scope. If you can see, if you can just raise your hand, if you can see the finder scope. Can you see the finder scope? Anybody? So now, can you use your uh, mouse? mouse pointer? Yeah, okay. that would be better. So this is the finder scope, okay? And this is the focuser 
of the telescope. And this is the camera that I bought, ZW178MC. Now, the first step is to align your finder scope with an eyepiece, preferably a 9mm or a 6.5mm eyepiece because the sensor on this camera is very, very small. So what you can see in a 25mm eyepiece, it won't show you that. So the first step for anybody starting manual Dobsonian imaging or even a manual, any man, manual telescope is to align your finder scope with the eyepiece here preferably a 12 mm, 9 mm, or even a smaller. I used 6.5 mm. Now what happens is that whatever you're seeing in your finder scope, you can see in your eyepiece. So first step is alignment. Now take out your eyepiece and put a barlow with it because the size of the planets is very small when you look it through this camera sensor. So a Barlow is always recommended when you're doing planetary imaging. So when you add Barlow to the imaging train, the focal plane changes. So what you need to do now, after you have set your finder scope, aligned your finder scope with your eyepiece, take out your eyepiece, put the Barlow, and again, put the eyepiece in it. Now again, align it, align it with the finder scope, see where you can see the planet now. Once it is sorted, the third step is to put your camera instead of the eyepiece. Just take out your eyepiece and put your camera in it. Now, uh, you would fail. Most likely, you would fail 10 times, but just don't give up. The fun of astrophotography is the more challenges you are, the more frustrations there are. Uh, the more you know, excited you are to you know, find a solution for all the challenges that you're facing. So insert your camera. Most likely the first time you would see uh, Jupiter on your screen and uh, it will drift very quickly. The, the way it came, it will just drift away. So don't lose your heart. Practice. Practice. What you need to do is then nudge your telescope. Again, uh, find Jupiter in your finder scope. Now you don't have the you know, privilege of seeing through an eyepiece because you have a camera inserted in that place. All you could do is Mark the area uh, mentally. I would do that mentally because every finder scope has a crosshair. If you don't have, uh, I think most of the finder scopes have a crosshair. Just ensure that, you know, where you're placing the planet in the finder scope, look at the crosshair. And most likely you will be able to align your finder scope with the image that you see on your laptop. This is a difficult process, very easy to say, but uh, when you actually practice it, it, it was a nightmare for me. It, it was so disheartening. You know, I would spend hours and uh, almost end up in tears because I couldn't see Jupiter in my screen. It was so easy with a smartphone. It was so easy with a DSLR, but it was so terrible, you know, to find Jupiter on my laptop screen. But uh, this is an obstacle which I overcame with practice. And I'm sure that everybody can. So this is the image that I took of Jupiter using manual tracking. So what I just explained in the previous, um, you are a planet at the same time, you are manually tracking the object because you're not using a go-to telescope. It's a manual telescope. You always have to find the object yourself. You have to align it in the finder scope. And eventually you will end up uh, getting a video so the whole idea is to get videos, as I said, using lucky imaging, you will end up getting a video and you will get an image like this. But uh, initially, uh, it is going to be a challenge. Just don't worry about it. But once you practice it, um, everything is very much sorted. Uh, I showed you Mars the first time I saw Mars in 2020. That was 28th of June at 5.21 AM. And this is the Mars image. Uh, I mean, Mars uh, was a delight. In 2020, it was just so good to be able to observe Mars and to image Mars at the same time. If you look closely at this picture, 
um, eight inch uh, aperture from Delhi skies, from heavily light polluted skies, I was still able to see the fine oat clouds on Mars, the carbon dioxide filled clouds on Mars. I was able to see a lot of albedo features of Mars and the uh, famous South Pole of Mars. This is uh, again, one of manual tracking image. Here you see Mars with a lot of blue aura. This is the North Pole of Mars uh, filled with a lot of carbon dioxide gas. So this is how Mars looked like. Now, when you take back uh, the first image that I took from a smartphone, you know, the stacked image and this stacked image from an astro dedicated camera, uh, you can now see what I said that, you know, it was a huge difference for me to uh, move from an image taken from a smartphone, then a DSLR, and then eventually buying an Astro dedicated camera. It's a game changer. It gives you so many details that otherwise uh, you couldn't have, you know, imaged these kind of intricate details that the planet is showing to you. The other important thing here to note is that uh, lucky imaging gives you those few images, you know, few frames where the atmosphere has been stable and you've been able to capture the planets at full glory. This is again uh, one of uh, my favorite images of Mars. I have uh, imaged Mars where, whenever you know the sky would permit me. And I, was, I would wait for Mars to come uh, above the south zone of buildings because the front of my southeast balcony, I have a bunch of buildings and I had to wait uh, to certain altitude where I could see Mars and start imaging Mars. Now, this is, uh, I do lunar, I do full disk lunar, um, but this is one of the first images that I took of lunar surface with a lot of intricate details. These are... I mean, that day the atmosphere was fairly stable, I must say, because all of the images that you're seeing, uh, the skies, the light pollution, and the st stability of the atmosphere plays a vital, vital role. If you get a good, <coughs> if you get good uh, atmospheric conditions, an eight-inch topsonian with an astro dedicated camera can give you wonderful details of the lunar surface. This is again, one of my favorite, <coughs> excuse my throat, my favorite uh, lunar surface. <coughs> now, what happened uh, when I was doing manual tracking? I ran into a challenge that, you know, I would see planet from my balcony for two hours, but I was able to see, I was able to image my, um, the imaging time for me was two hours, but I was only able to take three or four videos. The reason for that was that I wasn't on tracking. I was not tracking. So every few seconds, the planet would drift away. I would realign. So that whole process, it was so cumbersome and it was causing me, you know, the loss of precious time. I was not able to image as much as one could. So one of, uh, one of my astro friends suggested me to buy an equatorial platform. So this is an easy uh, thing to add to your Dobsonian. If you can see in the picture, there is, these are two platforms and this is aligned towards the north and this is aligned towards the south. You just need to do some rough polar alignment and there is a motor drive here, a very small motor. And uh, what it does is that it starts uh, the alt azimuth control of your telescope. So I was able to image more and I was able to uh, get more data as compared to when I was doing manual tracking. Manual tracking had its own fun. I told you the technique that I used to get the uh, object into the sensor, the chip area. Now I'm going to share some of the best practices for planetary imaging. Uh, and uh, how I'm telling you this because I've learned it. I have sweated it out I had frustrating moments. I had, uh, you know, there were times where uh, I would be out with my telescope and I would not even get one decent frame, let alone a whole video. So out of the frustrations, out of the practical challenges, I have, you know, this has come to my mind that what are the 
best practices if you want to start planetary imaging. You should always invest in aperture. Aperture fever is real. It's not a joke. It is absolutely real. And when it comes to planetary, the more aperture, the better it is. But to begin with, an 8-inch is a very, very decent aperture. Even for visual astronomy, 8 inches is recommended. And for planetary imaging, if you want to start, 8 inch is the way to go. The second part is to invest in a good focal length. Now, my telescope is 1200 mm focal length, which is the native focal length. And then I add a 2.5x power mate, Teleview power mate, which gives me a focal length of 3000 mm. So for planetary imaging, focal length is a must. And as you've seen through my journey, I started with the smartphone uh, photography. You've seen the images. You've seen the images that I got from DSLR. And investing in an astro dedicated camera, I would say it a must. And it is not very expensive to begin with. It, you know, the company like ZW or QHY, they produce these planetary imaging cameras. And uh, it's fairly reasonable, it's fairly priced. In fact, it is much cheaper than the DSLR camera that I was working with. The other and the most important thing is that you cannot possibly image every day. The weather, I'm not saying that there are clouds and you would take out your telescope. I don't mean that. What I'm trying to tell you that even though the sky is clear, the uh, other factors do play a vital role in planetary imaging. For example, one of the crucial elements that I learned was the altitude of the planets. If you're trying to image at 20 degree, the atmosphere turbulence would be so bad that you would not get good data. So all I can suggest and I can recommend that whenever you are imaging planets, ensure that they have at least reached 40 degrees of altitude. After that, after that, you would be able to image, you know, the, the data would be fairly, fairly good. Even from a light polluted city like Delhi, 40 degrees and above, I would not shoot anywhere below that. And now let's come to imaging best practices. Always use small capture area. I'm going to show you what I'm telling because most of you would not have seen a capturing software. So always capture a small area because you don't need so much of black space around the planet. That only adds to the, the image size, the file size. Do not uh, go for a big capture area. Use high FPS. As I said, uh, lucky imaging means high frame rate per second. Use high gain. So gain is equivalent to the ISO that we use in DSLR. And always, if you're using high gain, tend to use low exposure. This helps you. I mean, this is the mantra for good planetary imaging. And I'm going to demonstrate what actually I'm trying to say when I say this. This is the actual software. I use SharpCap Pro to capture the planets. If you look at this, uh, this is a live video that I captured. This is the first thing that I was mentioning, the capture area. Ensure that you are capturing where you can see the planet comfortably. You don't need a lot of black space around it. So I normally use 800 by 600. You can uh, use this 800 by 600 uh, capture area or even a smaller capture area for planets like Mars. The other thing that I mentioned was low exposure and high gain. Gain is directly associated with the ISO in normal DSLR cameras. So gain should be high. You would get a lot of noise, but don't worry. Don't worry. Uh, the stacking process will cancel out the noise. The exposure time, you know, here it is showing 17 millisecond, basis the brightness, basis your atmospheric conditions, you can increase or decrease the exposure. The lesser it is, the best it is for your uh, frame rate. You can see the frame rate in the down where, you know, I'm pointing. This is uh, shooting at 59 FPS, which is uh, fairly good. I have gone above 59. Now I shoot at 100 and 120 uh, FPS because this is uh, one column that if you switch, this is off. If you switch it on high speed mode, you will get more uh, frame rate per second. So the best practices that I share, capture area should be uh, small. Another interesting thing that I learned while doing uh, 
imaging from Astro dedicated camera that the file size could be huge. I was using 512 uh, GB SSD laptop. And the first imaging session that I held with my Astro dedicated camera, my hard disk stopped. It stopped capturing because the file size was so huge, the whole hard disk was gone. So what I learned was to uh, have a compatible laptop for astrophotography, which can take huge amount of data. So for example, now my file size is somewhere between 5.65 GB to 12 GB. So just imagine what kind of data that uh, comes when you're doing planetary or lunar or even solar imaging. This is uh, the result of high frame rate. This is the result of small capture area. This is the result of high uh, gain and low exposure. This is another interesting, this is high resolution moon. So till now what I've shared with you is the DSLR images of moon that I've taken. This is a high resolution image. This is bits and pieces of moon because moon will not fit into my uh, sensor, uh, my chip size of the 178 MC. So what I do is I take bits and parts of moon. Then I use a feature in Photoshop, which has a, a photo merge option in automation. And I get the stitched image of moon. I then uh, process it further to make it a mineral moon. This was 53,000 frames. And this was over 300 GB data that I had to process through the softwares that I used. The first software that I used was AutoStackArt for this. Then I used Registax. And then finally, I used Photoshop. So it took me two days to process the data and then make this mineral moon. So it's a pretty picture, but a lot of hard work, a lot of hard work. And why it is high resolution, The if you look at this image on my Facebook or you know other social platform if you zoom into this uh, this is very well defined the resolution is uh, the show uh, that this image shows the other DSLR image that I've shared do not have. This is Jupiter. And this is uh, once I started uh, using the best practices that I shared with you, I was able to get a lot of detail. If you see the GRS, it is also showing the eye of the GRS. This is, you know, if you have been observing Jupiter, if you have been imaging Jupiter, you know how these intricate details are so, so important for any astrophotographer. You know, a lot of details on the southern belt of Jupiter, which images I was able to do it this time because my frame rate was high. I was able to take a, a frame rate 210 where I would get a lot of image. Earlier, my images were a bit blurry. Now I, you know, this year I've seen a drastic change in the way I image planets. This is the transit of Io happening on Jupiter. I have captured many. Uh, this is how Saturn looks like through a ZWO camera. So you can also not only if you're not interested in astrophotography, you can just use it for uh, electronically assisted astronomy also. You can see the Cassini division very much visible and you can also see the bands of uh, Saturn. This is how the stacked image look like. This is what uh, I could image from Delhi skies, from uh, my bottle nine area and heavily light polluted area. I was also able to manage, uh, able to uh, get moons of Saturn along with the main planetary body. Saturn has an orbit. And you can visually also see them through an eyepiece. But I was able, since I was using a high gain, I was able to image the moons also. Uh, this is a different orientation of Saturn. The uh, south uh, is down and the north is up. And um, again, a family portrait of Saturn. These all images, this is all uh, work from my astro dedicated camera. 
you can uh, see uh, these uh, images on my different social media accounts. This is Venus. Now, when I was talking about uh, having to see uh, image planets at 40 degree uh, of altitude, Venus never reaches 40 degrees. So all we have to do is uh, try and focus our telescopes. It, I think this was at around uh, 18 or 20 degrees that I shot Venus. If you see that the atmospheric, I will play that for you again. Look at how much atmospheric distortion is there. It's very difficult to focus on Venus. It looks very bright and, uh, you know, anybody, any layman would say that it's very easy to image uh, Venus. It is not. It is one of the trickiest planet that you could ever image because of so much of atmospheric distortion. It's very difficult to focus. But then again, practice and you will achieve this. Uh, these are the rare events that I've managed to capture from my Delhi balcony. This is one of the penumbral eclipse shadow that I captured way back in June 2020. Lockdown was uh, full on. And this is a single image. This is not a stacked image. This is a smartphone image. This is the solar eclipse that happened. And uh, I was able, I managed to capture it from a southeast balcony. Um, <clears throat> Now, this is very interesting, and this is not an event that, you know, you would uh, find highlighted on the newspapers or all the sites, you know, shouting for uh, these kind of events, because this is uh, something which normally happens on Mars. Mars has huge dust storms. I managed to capture it from my Delhi skies. You can see the kind of, uh, you know, the, the structure of the sand uh, obscuring the albedo features of Mars. This I managed to capture from Delhi. This is uh, a video. So, if you so see, if you, you focus please... on the middle, uh, this is a live video of Mars. Sorry. So now, could you please? Amoli, you were saying uh, something. The... Yeah. Could you please go to the previous image and uh, show us the sandstorm using the mouse pointer? Sure. If you look at these, you know this this obscuration. This is all a huge sandstorm on Mars. So this is taken on a single day. If you look at the timings are also given. I was shooting in regular interval and uh, I was seeing this huge plume of dust storm on Mars. Uh, anybody who loves astronomy would sincerely uh, you know, feel the excitement that I was feeling that day. I was uh, sad also because I was not able to get sharp image of uh, Mars, the kind of features that I was seeing. But at the same time, imaging the dust storm on Mars was a very thrilling moment for me. And from that on time on, I knew that I was not going to image Mars as beautifully as I was because the whole of Mars was going to be engulfed in the dust storm. This is the uh, compilation where you see the actual video. This is the actual capture raw footage of Mars uh, dust storm, which I was capturing. And these are the resultant stacked images of Mars. Again, uh, one of the brilliant celestial event we all you know, saw 21st of December, Jupiter and Saturn coming so close together, six degrees apart. It was a beautiful uh, celestial event. Uh, this is something that you know does not happen in the uh, this part of the world, especially from Delhi. But uh, there was a rare Mars moon occultation which I managed to capture. This is one of the images. Uh, I don't have much time, but uh, there is a huge story behind it. I had to climb thirty five uh, uh, to the fourth floor carrying thirty five kgs of equipment to image this one image. So uh, very interesting. Uh, background story but uh, it was a stunning stunning visual sight and I was so blessed to have seen it and imaged it as well. Uh, this is uh, one of the rarest uh, event where I could image all the four moons of Jupiter and there were three moons that day that were transiting Jupiter. So Ganymede and Europa and Callisto in the right hand side if you see this is Callisto. Uh, this is Europa's shadow, this is Ganymede's shadow, and this is Ganymede itself and Europa itself. Io was emerging from behind Jupiter. So I was able to image four of the moons of Jupiter together. 
And uh, this was one of the thrilling events. I knew the Callisto's shadow was there, but I knew that due to the blockage in front of my southeast balcony, I would not be able to uh, image Callisto's uh, transit, but I was lucky to have uh, managed to image uh, Europa and Ganymede and Io as well. This is the rotation video that I made. I imaged for more than one and a half hours. And uh, this is how the actual transit looked like. It was, uh, again, it was giving me goosebumps while I was recording this. This was uh, one of those rare, rare moments that, you know, you see such beautiful things happening in the night sky. And I was lucky to have imaged it. Uh, so this is uh, my journey. This has been my journey so far. I have learned so much. Uh, astronomy has given me a different perspective on life and view. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Priya, ma'am, for giving me this opportunity to share my journey with you all. And uh, any questions that you might have, I'm happy to take those. Thanks so much, Sona. And uh, you've really proved to be so helpful for you know what we're trying to highlight in these specific sessions which we've had between 11th of Feb to 8th of March on women in STEM and science. And the way you uh, described the whole, your whole journey was really so interesting where you even highlighted the tough points, the frustrating points, because those are the tough things that we got to go through, right? And instead of losing heart, you just have to, you know, brave it through. And, and I would say that that is the bottom line also about uh, women pursuing careers in STEM, etc. You just have to kind of stick on, you know, there are problems, there are issues, but you just stay on. And I think you really showed that in the spirit in which you described everything. So thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sona. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. My pleasure. But but brilliant pictures, really. I mean, I feel uh, honestly, I feel ashamed being a professional astronomer when I see the kind of pictures that you have. I really feel so stupid. What have I been doing for so long? It's really very nice, very beautiful. You have all the knowledge in the world, and I'm what sure. Uh, that, yeah. But you know, finding time for these things is also a challenge for all the working women. You know, you are a full-time professor, and finding time and being awake the whole night, and then again next day you have to work. So everybody has to balance it out. And I also had some challenging times, you know, when there were some rare events and I had to give it a whole uh, night and, you know, image it. And at the same time, the next day, the work doesn't stop. So yeah, it's a challenge. And then being a woman, the extra challenges are always there. You know, you have to take care of your kids, you have to take care of your house. And at the same time, you're doing astrophotography. So the one big reward that I get doing astrophotography is that my kids feel that their mom is cool. <laughs> and that's the biggest reward that I have had, uh, you know, in doing and imaging such beautiful celestial bodies. That's right, that's right. Kids, I think, are the most important part of our lives. <laughs> yeah. So I think uh, Amoli has already put up her hand. Amoli, you have a question? Yes, ma'am. Sona, yes, I would just like to ask you that how do you decide upon the gain and the exposure depending upon the planet? Uh, so a lot of things play into that. Uh, you do a lot of test runs. So when you, like, you know, if you're doing imaging through DSLR, you take a lot of uh, dirty shots, which we call them, because you're using very high ISO and gain to see if you're getting the feature or not. So same with Astro dedicated camera. Bases your sky conditions that time, the gain. And so you get a lot of noise when you increase the gain, right? You must have tested it with your 178 MC also. But gain gets, the noise get canceled out when you stack the image. The exposure time is basis the uh, brightness of the body that you are imaging. Because Saturn is very dim, so you don't, you won't see anything uh, of Saturn if you just keep it at 17 millisecond. But at the same time, Jupiter being a very bright body at 17 ms, I have even shot Jupiter at 6 ms, 6 millisecond exposure. It works. So my recommendation would be to try it out with your sky conditions and see what gain and what exposure works for you. Oh. Uh, but, but I must tell you that your images are really awesome. They are beautiful, actually beautiful. And especially the moon images, it feels as if we are just about to land on moon. They are so crystal clear and so neat. I really love them. Thank you so much, Amoli. Thank you. Really appreciate these kind words.
Thank you so much. Anybody can image it, you know, it's, it's not so difficult and it's just a lot of practice. It's a lot of sweat, trust me, because I, we shoot in June and there are a lot of mosquitoes around. So always keep an Odomos handy, the spray handy with you, because that, uh, <laughs> you know, you can't be fighting the mosquitoes and imaging at the same time. So keep Odomos ready. Don't worry to sweat it out. We look terrible when we are doing astrophotography, but that's all part of the game. And we just love the images that, you know, we get. Obviously, the patience and the hard work pays out. And being a woman, I think we are rewarded with patience because we raise kids. So we are naturally inclined towards being patient. So I think astronomy is more suited, but I'm not, I'm not offending any uh, other gender. I'm sorry for that. But yeah, women are naturally very patient souls. Definitely. <laughs> Any more questions? You could, uh, uh, participants, you can either unmute yourself or you can put it on chat as you wish. Uh, do we have any more questions? And uh, on the chat, I've also uh, added in the, uh, the, you know, how could you join the WhatsApp groups, which we have already for, for citizen science. And uh, obviously we don't expect us to end with today's session. We will continue the interaction. So please do log in to, uh, you know, join the WhatsApp group. You could get in touch with Sona also and um, start your journey. That's what we would like. Absolutely. Don't worry about the bottle scales, guys. You can always image planet. You can always image sun, but with proper solar filters. And you can always image the beautiful moon all the time. Yep. Yeah, I have a question. Yep, sure, sir. Uh, how do I like? Uh, yeah, I'm interested in astronomy, but I don't have the basic knowledge of astronomy or astrophotography. So, what do you suggest, and how do you tell that I can start and uh, move ahead? So, you are interested in two different things. Astronomy can be done without a telescope. Uh, yeah. Astronomy is a subject in itself. Hmm. Astrophotography obviously needs a telescope and equipment uh, or even a DSLR with lens. You can do astrophotography. Okay. So Priya ma'am can answer the astronomy bit and I can answer the astrophotography bit. Priya ma'am. Uh, could you suggest any books? I think Sona, you go ahead because I think what he's referring to is more of... Uh... More astrophotography? Yep, I think so. All right. Because, uh, you know, with astrophysics, it's a whole story. You'll need to study for 10, 15 years. So. All right. So if you want to start astrophotography, I would recommend, as I said, invest in a Dobsonian, invest in a aperture size of eight inch at least. And uh, do not buy from Amazon. That was a mistake that I made. Uh, find resources, find uh, dealers and retailers of various brands available in India. See something which suits your budget because uh, essentially you know it's your hard-earned money that you're spending on the hobby so please uh, be cautious uh, and do not just uh, blindly buy if i am shooting from a sky sky watcher flex to dobsonian you don't need to buy that there are equally good brands available in the market uh, please do your research join a lot of whatsapp group that i would recommend uh, read a lot of posts on facebook join a lot of astrophotography groups on facebook mm -hmm. there you get a lot of uh, you know real time challenges which people are facing when they are starting their journey as some of the challenges that i shared with you all so be open be don't jump into buying that you want to do astrophotography tomorrow take your time uh, Start with your binoculars, take your time, watch the night sky, see the directions of your uh, location that you are, and then invest uh, in a Dobsonian or any other which fits your budget. Does that answer your question? Yeah, how do I start like uh, any books or something? Like that? There are a lot of uh, ebooks available. Uh, there is a very famous book that a lot of people read that is uh, starting left at Orion. I think that is one of the most uh, read book in astronomy. Uh, for astrophotography, sir, it is more of practice than theoretical knowledge. You have to get your hands dirty to learn astrophotography. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Does that answer? Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, he'll have to <laughs> start his thing. Is there any other question from someone else? Or uh, 
yeah uh, my other question is on astronomy what other books or something can i read basic basic astronomy yeah Priya, I, think that, I think for that it's a uh, with loads of resources on the net you can search that but i think now we don't have the time to give you all those links but you can have a look at a lot of the sites on the internet google and see the nasa esa sites etc i think that should be good and the other okay. thing is that you know if you are so interested you can start by downloading some stargazing apps so the apps if you click on one object it gives you a wikipedia link and you get to know about that celestial body a whole lot of information is there so you can start downloading if you are an android phone there are a lot of android free uh, apps also available you can start using the apps and you can start reading about the celestial bodies that uh, you are interested okay yeah. thanks sona <clears throat> so um uh, we'll try to stick to time so uh, i don't see any other question and um i'd obviously like to thank sona thanks so much so much for your thing and we obviously continue the interaction we'll keep in touch and uh, this is again to invite everybody for our final session i'm going myself advertisement <laughs> it's on the 8th of march we'll have the last of the series which i will be doing on uh, projects for uh, young women and uh, girls in astronomy right so do join us on the 8th of march at 8 o'clock in the evening thanks yeah, so ma'am i'm seeing a couple of questions in the chat box i didn't oh sorry uh, sorry i i didn't notice them um, yeah there are a couple of questions yeah, please uh, take them, them. is 8 inch topsonian good for different distant celestial bodies like nebular clusters etc uh yes mr ramesh it's good for a bright nebula like m42 which is orion i have captured it from my dobsonian but i would still recommend for uh, deep sky objects you need an equatorial go to mount a dobsonian does not justify because there's a lot of field rotation which happens when you're shooting from dobsonian so i would uh, recommend that uh, start with an equatorial mount if you want to go for deep sky uh, images uh is it better to buy a telescope or make one dobsonian oh i would love to do a diy on dobsonian you can easily make it it's not very difficult the resources are available uh but uh, people who do not have time for diy a branded dobsonian also is fairly cheap um what other questions do we have there's one what settings do i require for capturing a galaxy from uh so galaxies uh, see if you are using a dslr capturing galaxies then i would say that you look up uh, the model that you're using for example i can give you my example i have been capturing galaxies now i have started deep sky objects uh, very recently so the iso variant uh, my nikon d5000 is iso 800 i shoot at iso 800 and the exposure time uh you know basic if you're doing guiding you can stretch it up to 5 minutes but i am right now not using guiding so uh without guiding i am able to get 30 seconds to 60 seconds exposures easily uh if you're using smartphone i have actually never attempted uh, capturing galaxy from my smartphone but uh if you can then you need at least 30 seconds of exposure that is what you know my understanding is my budget does not scale up to buying a telescope and dslr please help me out with a smartphone with a smartphone that's very very ambitious yeah but at the same time i can recommend there is a facebook group which is called uh, smartphone astrophotography please check them out uh, i've seen a lot of people doing uh, some good stuff on that facebook group and they are actually not based out of india but do check that out And sorry, I, I like to button, but we've had an earlier in our earlier series, which we had last year. We actually had astrophotography with smartphones, which was done, I think, by Amit Raka. I yes, yeah. I I have seen that on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So wonderful. Please have a look at that video, and that could be helpful for you for talking. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Somebody is giving a link also to Amit yeah. Raka's YouTube video, and uh, you can have a look at that. yeah so i think that's that covers the question yeah that's all thank you so much thank you thanks so much ma'am so much thanks so much for the session thank you everyone clear skies clear skies and see you on the 8th of march at 8 o'clock
Absolutely. I love to join that. Thank you, ma'am. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.